I'm over that nonsense. What's that? Because in a group, there's always someone who ruins everything. <laughs> yeah, this was a possibility. Nay, an idea that could have borne fruit in our reality. Lee and Clementine and their ragtag group of survivors facing off against the fast moving and brutally mutating green flu infected. A big departure from the slow-moving, decaying corpses of the Walking Dead universe. With a brief discussion on the game's 10th anniversary, former Telltale devs revealed that Left 4 Dead and Valve were who they approached first upon making a zombie. They're not even zombies, they're just infected. They got like this rage virus, amps them up like they've been smoking the swag. Narrative based game. Opening up ideas on how differently things would have played out, and it got me thinking what crossovers and spin offs have successfully panned out for the Left 4 Dead series, and which ones have been murmured but never brought into reality. Today, we are discussing Left 4 Dead spin offs and crossovers. The Left 4 Dead franchise is a critically acclaimed and well-revered series, but in its near 14 years of existence, the public has only really been drip-fed media involving the green flu-ridden infected and their effects on their universe. The most we have ever gotten is one game with a single DLC, and another game with tons of DLC that really just brought in the first game with tons of different game modes and, most importantly, expansive mod support. While we can chalk up its replayability and freshness due to mod support, the game has stayed relevant despite tons of others over the last decade trying to emulate that formula. But we aren't here to discuss why Left 4 Dead is so good, but the spin-offs and tie-ins. And in that regard, besides the games, we have only ever gotten one series of comics leading up to the Sacrifice DLC, the Sacrifice comics themselves being a decent window into the personalities and interactions of the original cast of Survivors and a snippet of their past as we see them during the initiation of the outbreak and as they face the US military, quarantine, and the slew of infected leading up to Bill's sacrifice. But after that, we have been left high and dry in terms of content, media, and lore for the Left 4 Dead IP. It's still a damn shame we never got anything comic or shorts-wise to show us what happened to Coach, Ellis, Nick, and Rochelle, but maybe it's better leaving their fates up to interpretation rather than it being about them probably being lined up and executed by CETA and the military. Nothing else has given us a bird's eye view of the Left 4 Dead universe beyond two groups of survivors and the environmental easter eggs to describe the green flu pandemic. But you're not here to hear me complain about lack of content and media for the series, now are ya? Well, here and there over the years, we have had a few instances of spin-offs and tie-ins that have come to light and some that will forever remain in the dark. In most cases, tie-ins for Left 4 Dead include inclusion of characters and items. Dead by Daylight featured Bill as its first licensed survivor alongside the outfits of Francis, Ellis, and Zoe, while eventually adding in Noam Chomsky, the safe room door, the top half of Boomer, the News Chapter 5 helicopter, and the iconic four-finger discount hand as charms, and giving backstory to Bill for his time served in Vietnam with bloody results. Even giving Bill his first different outfit besides a hospital gown, but not changing his head to a younger appearance, which I still don't understand why they didn't use the brown-haired, grizzled young, sexy vet look they used in the Tome trailer, but still glad to see some lore for any survivor at all at this point. Dying Light came in with a few different elements of the Left 4 Dead series, one being William Bill Overbeck as a custom outfit, but also throwing in unique craftable weapons like the guitar, golf club, and frying pan with their unique sound. <laughs> on top of guns reminiscent from the series with incendiary rounds, but best of all, having Noam Chomsky as a usable weapon as well. Resident Evil, during its heyday of making it purely action in Resident Evil 6, brought in the Left 4 Dead 2 survivors as playable character reskins, as well as bringing in the tank and witch as reskins to fight against the hordes of undead and technically infected. It's kind of gray area there now. And as a decently sized crossover was with the Zombie Army franchise, including all all eight survivors over the two games as playable characters to slay through the campaign with. Although the lack of voices feels pretty weird. Damn, it's dark down here. <sighs> That's it. Kill confirmed. Suicide. Bruno, the ground's collapsing. A chasm of lava just swallowed the tracks. 
Survivors, hold on, I'm coming. Mm, nope. To bump up the coolness factor, not only did they bring in all eight survivors, but they even came out with a short comic called Wrong Place, Wrong Time that bridges the gap to why our southern infected killers are now mowing down Nazi zombies. You wanna kill a Nazi? A nazi, nazi crazy. I've never really played Zombie Army, but just from this stuff alone, I'd honestly say I should give it a try at some point as the Left 4 Dead head that I am. Another franchise that toyed with the crossovers was Payday, that included the PC only update where a heist at Mercy Hospital occurred, even with Bill showing up momentarily as a patient, with endings supposedly tying into the criminals being the cause of the green flu outbreak, although this is not officially canon, but for fun nonetheless. Basically, with all these Left 4 Dead crossovers and add-ons, the developers, when they were trying to decide what they wanted to put in their games, they were basically saying... These small tie-ins and reskin crossovers are all we have really gotten. And I'm not dissing the content from Dead by Daylight, Dying Light, Resident Evil, Payday, and Zombie Army and their inclusion of the Valve property. I love that Left 4 Dead has still gotten representation and recognition to this day, and many fans have been starving for new official stuff up until the Last Stand update of 2020. But before all of this, we could have gotten more. And if there's anything, any one thing, any fandom in the universe wants. It's more. And what do we want more of? Left 4 Dead, yo. Well, as any self-respecting fan of Left 4 Dead can tell you, most fans have picked apart a certain scene to see some certain infected to give us Left 4 Dead's only known motion picture appearance in a certain movie. The 2012 film Cabin in the Woods brought about dozens of different horror references from folklore to movies to games. And if you look real closely, you can see our old friends Boomer Chan and Waifu Wit. But what if I told you this slight easter egg possibly went a bit further beyond two small boxes on a cluttered screen? Rumors of a possible crossover campaign depicting the titular cabin and its underworkings of horrific proportions had sprung up shortly after the movie's official release. But as history would have it, Cabin in the Woods had a troubled development due to financial difficulties with MGM, forcing its original release date of February 2010 to be pushed back much later and to another distributor, eventually finishing and having its first release in December of 2011 under Lionsgate. With the movie's original release date being so close to the release date of Left 4 Dead 2 in November of 2009, it's possible Mutant Enemy Productions had something cooked up with Valve. According to Chet Falasek, Left 4 Dead 2's writer, both Josh Whedon and Drew Goddard, approached Valve after playing the game and presented the idea of building a campaign based on the movie and its premise. And really at that point we were just kicking around ideas of what would be interesting and didn't get past that stage in it. The, their release was a long release. Yeah. Um, we were originally talked about a long time before Ooh. that. Yeah, our, our idea on our side was, well, what if we took parts of that movie and made a more uh, removed version of Left 4 Dead, essentially, where you were more in control and less just playing it. And we don't always talk about that. I think that would be a fun kind of mode to play around. Goddard stated on a Reddit AMA that the players would be able to step into the cabin and even walk around the facility and fight the monsters that appear in the movie. How this would have been pulled off is a total mystery though. The idea of going through the woods in Left 4 Dead is no foreign matter. And then having two to three chapters in the underground portion of the labs would be perfect. But incorporating tons of different monsters and entities that we see throughout the movie, I honestly doubt that would have panned out beyond our typical green flu infected busting out and just being a normal Left 4 Dead campaign. Maybe just reskins of the special infected to spice it up to become other horror icons and folklore and movies? Considering Left 4 Dead 2 campaigns were all officially canon up until the release of Matthew Lordelay's Cold Stream, it would have brought a lot into questioning, possibly giving the survivors an alternate ending instead of their helicopter escape in New Orleans. But since the cabin in the woods had faced bankruptcies and multiple delays, whatever reality we would have experienced for the Left 4 Dead 2 survivors in a fully playable campaign based on the motion picture will never come to pass. And this one boomer and this one witch will be doomed to remain in cubicles for all eternity. Or until the infection kills them, whichever comes first. But hey, we still have decent custom campaigns based on horror movies like Dead Before Dawn. Thank you. 
Speaking of movies possibly related to the Left 4 Dead brand, based purely on speculative manner, this is just rumors, many believe Zombieland was directly or at least heavily inspired by Left 4 Dead. Zombieland, released on October 2nd, 2009, one month before the sequel's release of Left 4 Dead 2 in November of the same year. Zombieland, having four survivors, one of which, Woody Harrelson looking a lot like Francis, meeting up and throwing down against hordes of the undead, until eventually an action-packed finale occurs before the four ride off into the sunset. Rumors of a possible crossover promotion stirred up shortly at the start of Left 4 Dead's release, with many noting these similarities, and some reported that the production team behind Zombieland even attempted to utilize elements or at least the name of Left 4 Dead, leading a few to believe the movie itself was supposed to be a live-action horror-comedy adaptation of the game. But apparently, Valve would deny Columbia and Sony Pictures the rights to use the game's name in both the beginning and ending credits. Not much else is known, maybe when Zombieland 3 comes out in 2029, right before the release of Left 4 Dead 3 in 2030, maybe then will that crossover or adaptation happen. But as to not get shit stirred up and start getting people looking all this up, that's all just a theory. A GAME THEORY! <laughs> but the biggest thing to rise up from the Pantheon Jr. of unaired Left 4 Dead spinoffs was of course the recent bombshell that was Telltale's expressed interest in adapting not The Walking Dead, but Left 4 Dead itself. That's right, the very game and franchise that skyrocketed Telltale to super popularity and then oversaturation may not have been set in the world of the Walking Dead comics. Telltale was no stranger to Valve properties at this point, as GLaDOS from the Portal series was brought in as a card dealer for Poker Night alongside Brock Sampson, Ashley J. Williams, Claptrap, and Sam the Dog. But to not tangent too hard, to quote the Walking Dead 10th anniversary documentary video on the Skybound Games channel. The very first Walking Dead prototype, which actually was for a different zombie thing that ended up turning into the Walking Dead. The first conversation was actually with Valve, and it was about what if we did a narrative side story in the universe of Left 4 Dead. That was when Sean and Carl had started this prototype of the sort of the boiling pots or spinning plates and all and that, that was a text was, game. That was a text yeah. game. The prototype was a completely text-based game that presented options for the player to choose instead of seeing them actually play out in the game world as in the final version of The Walking Dead with bad or late decisions causing their narratives to go wrong. But it turns out that thematically that's actually a lot closer to what The Walking Dead is about than, than yeah. Left for Dead or even a lot of other zombie franchises, so it ended up being a really good fit. We didn't end up making a Left 4 Dead game. I'm really glad that didn't work out. You know, I'm sure, Robert, because if there's one thing that Walking Dead surely needs these days is another spinoff. Oh, no. And don't get me wrong, Telltale's The Walking Dead was, and still is, some of the best writing and having the most engaging characters in gaming. Well, mostly just season one. So the deal with Valve to make an episodic narrative-based choice game on Left 4 Dead was mulled over, but never finalized, just being in the prototype stage, passing the torch to Lee and Clementine in the comic universe of The Walking Dead. To me, this would have been a breath of fresh air to the rather shallow pull of narrative Left 4 Dead has had in its lifespan. We could have been able to explore more groups of survivors as the green flu broke out, expanding the world more than what we know. Maybe even had an alternate universe where Atlanta fell under the green flu's effects and Lee's impromptu escape from the police and finding Clementine still occurred. Although I don't know how many scenarios from the Walking Dead games would play out as they did. Maybe Larry gets infected and becomes a heart attack tank. <laughs> Easy. Or Duck's annoying ass after he gets infected becomes the equally annoying jockey. A mystery. <laughs> Hordes of infected basically breaking into the hotel or pharmacy, easily giving Lee less of a chance to pick up random objects to throw and distract him. Who knows? The pace would be a whole different spectrum, though. Imagine it, the difference between the Walking Dead slow-moving walkers and the green flu infected. 
Maybe the Telltale model could have worked for fleshing out the backstories of the eight survivors we have come to know and love. The Walking Dead Michonne is a good example of just this. Considering the sacrifice and its comics released in September of 2010, showing brief pasts of the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors as the Green Flu outbreak started, which would be around the time Telltale would have started working on or be in the midst of discussions and development of whatever zombie narrative title they were working on since Left 4 Dead was their prototype. Hell, Telltale spinoff 400 Days that bridges the gap between Season 1 and 2 of The Walking Dead covered different sections of survivors that led up to them all meeting. This could have been utilized for both groups of survivors and what they had to do to survive up until becoming core components of their two separate but four-man groups, and the choices they had to make being decisive and morally gray and vast, depending on the decisions you make for them. Maybe show what happened to Francis after his rooftop bar brawl. Did he reluctantly have to kill his companions, or did he sneak out before things got worse? Did Coach have to kill his high school football team of infected, or did he abandon a bus full of them to get to the evacuation point faster and save himself? Or did Ellis choose to save or kill Keith? And maybe that's why Ellis brings up his life partner so much, out of either guilt or longing to see his buddy. They don't have to be world-changing aspects to the characters. What was done for the comic version of Michonne wasn't something drastic that changed who she was and your perception of her as she was portrayed by Kurtman's depiction of her in the comics. So the same could be said for the groups of survivors. There might be some small tidbits, but it really doesn't change how you view them. The survivors don't know each other before meeting up and go off each other at face value and how they communicate. So why not have something like that to at least give a little more meat on the lives they led? or at least what they were up to and their day-to-day goings-on before the Green Flu forced them to become different people. But that's just me rambling about Telltale's Left 4 Dead. And with Telltale gone and its devs discussing the early days of the studio, we can only imagine how this text-based game might have fleshed out. But who's to say it would have gone anywhere and brought Telltale to become the titan it was before it Guitar Heroed itself and faded away? I can only imagine how Clementine and Lee would have gone against a tank. So can campaigns based on a walk in the woods leading to a compound of horror, a faint inkling of a live-action Left 4 Dead that will remain as just a fan production on YouTube, and a text-based action world concept Walking Dead style Left 4 Dead story game that may or may not have been the peak content of a now extinct development studio. Maybe in the future we could see more crossovers and spinoffs that won't remain in the dark. And if you know me, if we can get Coach, Ellis, and any of the survivors included as playable characters, Easter eggs, or include the previous special infected in any way, I am always down. Oh, no, no, no! We're not unreasonable. I mean, no one's gonna eat your eyes.